Hey, Billy. So, so uh, Paul just got here. So, what's up, right, brother? We're in there now. All right, guys. We're gonna get started in a second. All right, Doctor Billy. Hey. hey, Paul. How you doing, brother? Good to see you. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna adjust the camera just so that it, it it's lowered a little bit, so it's not. It doesn't just get the top of my head. Just give me just one sec. Okay. Let's hope that that works. Good. Okay, cool. So what I will do too is put my phone on vibrate. Um, and let me get those questions that I prepared for you uh, out just so that I know what I'm talking about. And did you have a chance to, uh, to uh, you, you took, took a look at those? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll okay, get. great. Okay, cool. So listen, um, we're live now, you guys. Um, if I can get a real quick uh, mic check on there, just let me know that you guys can hear me okay, so that I know that we're doing all right. Um, I we are very, very, very lucky and fortunate, and might I say blessed to have uh, Dr. Osbrooks with us. Um, he's very, very busy. For those of you who don't know, um, you know he's a, an amazing YouTube sensation, motivational speaker. I, do, is pastor correct? Um, a motivational artist, man. I, I lead, you know, from from what I do, but I, I, yeah, I prefer fantastic. to be called motivational artist. And a PhD. So, God is good. God is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, I've had a chance to watch a lot of your videos, a lot of your content. For those of you who are just logging in, I purchased quite a few of these books, uh, Blessed and Unstoppable, for us here at our office. Um, and for those that don't know, I run a real estate brokerage, um, and, uh, that's going to be on our required reading list. See me so that I can get you a copy. And I also received some of your signed autographs, which is pretty cool. So I appreciate you doing that for us. Um, let me just get this up real quick and then we'll get started. So I asked you as a favor to come share a little bit about your story. Um, I feel like my group could really, really benefit from uh, hearing where you come from, what you've been up to, what's been going on. So uh, why don't we just dive into it? Okay. Now, I know that your, your career originally started 17 years ago in music. Right. Yeah? Okay. So talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, how did, what brought you or what attracted you to that initially? Uh, my whole family um, was in the music business. My my mother and father both were musicians, um, taught lessons. My mother has a master's degree in music. Um, my grandmother had a music store for 25 years. So all the kids taught lessons and things like that. And my dad is actually, uh, was actually in the, in, in the Alabama Music Hall of Fame for um, really? you know, being a studio musician. Yeah. So wow. from the time I was, you know, one week old, I'm I'm hearing music from that point on and I spent many of my early, early years when I was little um, down with my grandmother there at the music store. So um, while my mother and, and father were teaching things like that, I'd be being there with uh, my grandmother there at the music store. So it was kind of um, planning in me early, man. So Got it. I just continued the, uh, the tradition for so long. Man. It was just in our blood. So um, that's what I, I pursued heavily. Um, I love music, man. There's something about it, the way it you know, touches us on the inside. There's nothing else like it. And from the time I was one year old, I mean, I, I just loved it, man. Okay. Well, look, if you haven't seen any of his videos yet, one of the first things that I noticed about your, your inspirational and your motivational videos was you dubbing that to music, right? <laughs> and right. Um, I mean, is it safe to say that you were the father of doing that, putting these motivational speeches to music? I, I mean, I remember seeing quite a few, but none right. of them the way you were doing it. I mean, well, it they, was... There, um, there were plenty before me that, that were doing the music aspect, but what I do a little differently is, is I tend to map and create the motivation to match the music. So gotcha. that's where I, I don't really call myself a motivational speaker. I say motivational artist because it gives okay. me a little bit more freedom to create. And what I like to do is bring in the poetry, bring in the lyrics, bring in the songwriting aspect that I did in, in the music for so long, bring it into the motivation because I believe it resonates and touch people at a deeper level than just, just the mind. I want to touch their spirit, um, their soul, their thinking, all of this. And if I can get to that level, then I can help shift them to a level um, of success mentally in the, in, in the thinking. So um, I am definitely thinking that I'm creating a, a whole new genre and like a whole new lane yeah. with, with um and, and, you know, blazing the path for others to come behind and, and, and follow this, this yeah. whole uh, motivational artist thing. For sure. For sure. I mean, it caught, it caught my attention. I'm sure it's caught a lot of other people's attention and it's inspiring. It's, I mean, I listen to it in the car, working out, you know, a lot of it, it, it 
it, it gets you going. It gets the juices flowing for sure. Uh, okay, so what was like the the aha moment where you were like, okay, because clearly you haven't left the music, or the the industry, or the profession. But what was the aha moment that left you that made you want to leave the genre? Uh, is that right? The genre of music that you were in before, or the well, audience? Let's say the audience that you were attracting before versus the audience that you're attracting now. Okay, well, from from high school on, I I was in the rap business, um, on air music personality. I had my own radio show, um, producer, songwriter, artist. Had songs on Billboard. Um, just did everything in that. I just immersed myself in that whole lifestyle, chasing the money, the fame, the the wild women, all of that stuff that comes with it. The whole lifestyle, you know. Um, and I did that heavy and aggressively, um, pursuing success, what the world calls success, for seventeen years. Um, but something was missing on the inside. No matter like how high I went or you know, how, how good a song did um, or what accomplishments I made, I still had this emptiness. And it seemed like the higher that I went up, the more that, that hole inside began to grow. So I started examining things. I'm like, something is off here. You know, um, I've got what, what the world says is success and all this, but it's just not um, on the inside. I just don't feel right. So I started to examine what was going on, on the inside. And, I got to a point where I was just kind of burnt out. I'm like, I kept hitting this one ceiling. Like I, I, I didn't just want to be the top, you know, 5% in the music game. I wanted to be the top, top in the, in the music right. game. And I kept hitting this ceiling for years. Every time I drop an album, I'd hit the top, and I wouldn't go over into that next level of, you know, echelon of success that I was pursuing. So finally, about the, the last album I did, I'm like, something's off here. So I reached out to God, and this is the first time I'd really, you know, reached out to him. I'm like, you know, if if this music thing is not what you have designed me to do, and I'm doing this on my own physical strength myself, and, and you're not in this, then what I want you to do is just kill this off and get me to what you've been you know, designed me to do. If you are in this, I'll stay in this thing and grind it out and keep persisting and, and keep doing these things as long as I have to do it. I'm not scared to grind. I'm not scared for rejection. I'm not scared to work, but I just need to know that you know, you're in this with me, God. You know? And about, this was in 2007 in, in the, fall of 2007, I made, basically made a pack. I was like, the things that I haven't been able to do, I wrote down on a list. And I was like, Lord, if you're in this, make these things happen. If you're not, I'm going to shut this thing down and you can guide me to whatever you want me you know, to do. Um, a couple months later, after making that list, my father passed away in front of me. And that was the beginning of this journey that I'm on now. It made me examine everything in my life. Um, I basically had that aha moment there um, when he died in front of me, because then I realized life was real and precious and, and something that, you know, we only get one shot at. Up until this point, I felt like Superman, like I could do, uh, you know, in my own strength, whatever I wanted to do. And being this time I was in my 30s, you know, I just wasn't thinking about dying. I thought, OK, when you get 80, 90, you worry about dying. Um, but this this moment where he passed away unexpectedly right in front of me made me confront um, that reality that one day I'd be in the ground. And what did I want to be remembered for? You know, when, when he passed away, the funeral director asked me, uh, what did I want on my dad's headstone? The funeral director asked me, what did I want in his obituary? Now, I had never thought about these things because my father was in good health as far as I knew. And he was 63 when he passed away, but looked 50. So I didn't see this coming. It like really caught me off guard. So as I was writing his, I began to think about, well, if I was to die right now, unexpected like this, what would they write on my headstone? What would they write in the obituary? And I wasn't really happy with what, you know, at that time, what had transpired in my life and what they would write. You know, it'd be like, here lies a man who served himself, you know, didn't care about other people, just chased money, just chased fame and, and did whatever he could do to get on. You know, that was my mindset of the, you know, that lifestyle. That's all it was. It was like, you know, cutthroat, the whole music business is pride, ego, money, fame, all of that. So, um, I began to examine things right then um, around 2007 and it was a long journey. It was almost 10 years before I actually stepped fully into what I'm doing now. Um, but that was the beginning of the journey. And you mentioned in, um, in the question you saw me earlier asking about the, the two days before my father passed away, I was in a bookstore and um, I had got a hold of this copy called a uh, prosperity Bible. And it was like old classic, like I think 18, 19 books, like think and grow rich, early 1900 new thought, um, new era type of um, thinking. 
And I was like, oh, I heard about this power of the mind stuff. You know, I really want to harness that and see, you know, what, what I could do with my mind. And then two days later, when he passed away from me, I literally lost my mind. So it's kind of like you have to lose yourself before you find yourself, right? Yeah. So um, when he passed away in front of me, um, unexpected like that, it caused PTSD and panic attacks in me. So for the next seven years, man, everything that I had built up in the music business, all the money, the fame, the name, all of that, slowly got stripped away because I could not work. I could not function. Um, I went from being on stage, you know, in front of 20,000 people with a mic in my hand, rocking clubs and venues, to being in um, a bedroom for two weeks at a time, not wanting to come out because I was scared I was going to have a panic attack. So, like, it literally... Everything that I had worked for slowly died. It was like a death by a thousand cuts. Every day I got up, I'd have another panic attack. Um, like the first nine months there, I went to the hospital 12 times thinking I was going to die. I'd run in there with a panic attack and tell these you know, people, I'm dying, I'm having a heart attack, or I'm having a um, seizure, or I'm having a, a stroke, or whatever my mind was playing right. tricks on me to do. And um, it literally ripped everything away from me. And I woke up maybe five years later, not even knowing how I got here. I'm just like, everything's gone. All the people gone, all the fame gone. Nobody's calling on my phone. I always make this joke that um, I called AT&T like five years after, after that, um, that incident with my father. I called AT&T and I'm like, can you check my phone? There's something wrong with my phone. And they're like, what do you mean? You know, I said, it's not ringing. Can you please check? And they did all the checks. They did all that. There's nothing wrong with your phone. So why do you think you know, something's wrong with your phone? I said, because no one's called me in weeks. Right. Because the whole music industry was about like what you could really do for other people. And, you know, could you get them in the club that night? Could you get, you know, help them get on stuff like that? So right. I, I had a, a reality moment, like a lot of the people that were around me at the time really weren't there for me. You know, so that was another another uh, eye opening experience. So um, basically the panic attacks and the PTSD um, ripped everything away from me until I was just all alone. Until I was just really in my own thinking. And uh, it was just me and really God. And that is the beautiful place. The most beautiful place you can be is when it's you and God, because right. that's where he can build you and shape you. You know, I always say that a moment of desperation is the invitation for divine intervention. So when I, I got to that place of desperation, God began to move on my life and honored what I'd asked him to do in 2007. When I said, if the music business is not what you want me to do, then kill it off. And that's exactly what he did. It, you know, it, it was killed off. And then he began to prepare me and mold me and shape me for what I'm doing here today. So what do you say for, to someone who thinks that they, you know, they know something might not be quite right. They know they might need some type of, of therapy. And, and mm -hmm. when I say therapy, that could be medical attention or that could right, be therapy, right, right. therapy from God. What do you say to the person, especially men, because men can be really, really macho and, and especially in, in the, right. the rap or hip hop community, right? Exactly, I mean, you've got exactly. a lot of macho men. Okay? Right, exactly. What do you exactly. say to that guy that says, I don't need help? I don't need help. I learned it the hard way. You know, the first <laughs> year and a half, I tried to literally do it on my own when my father died. I didn't, first of all, I didn't realize I had a problem. I just thought I was, you know, mourning and things like that. But there was really a bigger issue going on from the trauma that, that I saw in, in the room when he passed away. So I tried to handle it for a year and a half. And, myself had i went to therapy right away i probably wouldn't have had the depth of um struggle in the seven year battle that i had i, I, I probably could have dealt with that early if i'd have had professionals around me so the one thing i regret the most is not going right away to talk about those things that were building up in me so um i used to just like you said i come from that world where you do it yourself you know there's no one there helping you it's like you gotta grind you gotta overcome it you know we tough we just keep moving but with this kind of thing on the emotional side and the, and the mental, mental stuff that was going on, I just could not do that. And um, it's, it's not something to look down upon if you need help. Go get help. You know what I mean? And um, it took me, like I said, it took me a year and a half before I finally said, okay, I, I need to, to go see something about this because I'm not even handling this. I got to the end of me. Right. You know, I tried everything I could do. Um, I'd already started reading, man. I started reading like in 2000. And, um, while I was still doing music, I, I started immersing myself into um, self-help and personal development. I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad back in 2000, and he started speaking about um, literacy, learning um, personal development, things like that, that we're not taught in school to immerse ourselves in that world. And I bought into his philosophy. And from the moment I read his book on, I stayed in a bookstore. I'd be in a bookstore three or four hours every single day. Nobody was telling me to go. I just loved it. I got immersed in the whole world and I would read spiritual books, art books, 
um, personal development, personal growth, psychology, all the, you know, positive thinking, all these kinds of um, uh, materials. I was just pouring in myself from 2000 on. And I used to tell my mom, I, I'd be like, I don't know what's going on here, uh, but I feel like I'm being prepared for something. And now, now it makes sense. But at the time, I, I really didn't know. I just know I love this stuff. I, I bring my notebook in there and just take gang of notes every single day. And what happened in, in the music business was I got too much knowledge in me. Like the stuff I was saying in, in the rap world and stuff I was saying in the clubs at night, the gang life, the, the bang, bang, shoot them up, all of that. I had all this power. I'd be in the daytime reading Think and Grow Rich and uh, Science of the Mind and the 48 Laws of Power, all this um, knowledge and wisdom. And then at night, I'm going into these clubs seeing all this yeah. ignorance. So there was like, there was a, I was torn. I was like, hold on. About five years into reading like that, I was like, this stuff, I, it don't make any sense what I'm saying here in the club at night. You know, like, I, w once I poured all this in, you know, once you get enough truth in you, you can't, you know, lies can't exist. And, and I couldn't live in that facade anymore. That's when I started really questioning things. And um, my last album, which you had um, asked about in the questions, was called Me Versus Me. And that was a befitting title because it was the old me, you know, who, who was buying into that. And there was this new me emerging that needed a little bit more than just surface level um, type of relationship, surface level type of music, surface level type of lifestyle. I needed something deep, something I could connect to on the inside. And, and I knew it was missing. So I began to uh, write deeper type of lyrics, began to incorporate more of me into the music. Up until this point, I was just living... Uh, what other people wanted me to do like you know if, if they said okay well you know if you talk about drugs these records will sell real quick so I would write about drugs if they said you know make a make a dance song for women to dance to and go okay I'd make that whatever people told me to do that's what I was doing but the only thing I wasn't doing was doing me so like I, there, there was like I was very successful because I could write I could you know go into uh, the mindset and capture a club and get it on record I could cop capture the the feeling the vibe all that kind of stuff I, you know I had that gift to do that but the thing was, it just was not me. It just was not, you know, I wasn't connected personally with it the way I wanted to connect with it. So that last album, I began to um, slowly start incorporating um, myself into it. And I, I realized that was also part of the journey of doing what I'm doing now. It was, I was beginning to bring my poetry and beginning to bring me into my work, which made me more passionate about what I'm doing. All right. So all these little things that I did through my life that didn't seem to make sense at the time, um, looking back, it all makes sense. And I was like, okay, I understand why that piece needed to come in and this piece then. And, but at the time it all looked like chaos. I just looked like, like why is this struggle going on year after year after year, you know, but um, it was all preparation. You know, we can't so, rush the process. I guess, and I wrote this down. What, what, couldn't we have just transitioned and like done something like what, like what a Kirk Franklin does? Or did you ever think about doing that type of genre? I, um, I did when I first, I, when I first um, started my healing, and I, I got around some um, really great therapists and things like that. This one guy really, really um, impacted me. This therapist that I finally found after like going to six or seven um, therapists, I finally found one. Um, started to recover somewhat and I was like okay I'll go right back into music what I was doing because I had stopped being sick and um, I flirted around with doing um, gospel rap and, and, and Christian um, themes and topics but at this time I didn't know enough to rap about I was like I come from the the, the thug life and it was all about rims women uh, money this and I'm like well how do, what do I talk about over here like I didn't have enough knowledge of, of, of um, description things like that to know what to even write about so I flirted with a couple of songs but I couldn't really see the bigger picture. Like I, I didn't really see how it all fit together. Got so um, I did that for a couple months and I was like, something's off, something's mi you know, missing. And um, I just kind of laid it down at the time. You know, I thought, okay, the rap life is over. I need to do something else, whatever God wants me to do. And I didn't see how he was going to use those gifts and things that I had learned back then to do what he's doing now. I couldn't see it. I thought it was something separate. Like, okay, that was my music life. And then there's what God has for me. I didn't realize those two were together. Right. So I, I kept feeling like, okay, you're trying to go back to the world that God moved you out of and still trying to stay in that world, you know? Fair enough. Okay, so, and that leads me to the next question then. So what's your opinion of Kanye? So Kanye um, is moving, and I'm a big, I'm a big fan of his. Right. Uh, you know, what, what do you feel about that? Um, I don't know him personally, so I can't, can't um, you know, talk about much about his, his testimony, conversion, all that kind of stuff. But I can say this, man, he is an amazing artist. He's a genius. Um, he 
is bringing massive attention and glory to God. So, man, that's what it's about. So I, I leave the rest to, to God and him. That's, that's not yeah. me to just, I yeah. just appreciate what he's doing. And I know that a lot of times industries or um, religion and things of, of these nature, they're not usually changed by the people that are in them. They're usually changed by an outsider that has a different view that brings it in. And he's showing a different way of bringing the gospel to people and to the masses, man. And, and I think that's what we need in this world today. I think we need a different approach than we had in the early 1900s. We've been in the church for so long. We've been still living 18, 1900s in America, still trying to um, reach people that way. And I think he's bringing in these other things, man, and opening up um, the masses, the world to, to uh, God. So, man, I'm all for that, man. Yeah, uh, it's like the message that I sent you. I mean, if he can do it for Saul, right? Yes, yes, yes. Kanye, so, that's know. real, man. To yeah. God be the glory. That's what it's yeah. all about. And he's giving Absolutely. God glory, bringing attention to him. So I'm all for that. Okay, so um, now you, you talked, I, I've heard a couple of your other interviews where you talked a little bit about how you transitioned into the message, right? And to right. actually uh, giving lessons at church and that's mm -hmm. how it started and that, that springboarded you. So one of the first lessons that you gave was um, it's, it's God still moves. What, what did you mean by that? And, and is that something that you still, uh, you still repeat and share with other people? When I was... Um maybe six or seven uh this group came to my church um and we went to hear them uh perform and they had a song called god still moves and my mother loved it and my father loved it and they would always go around the house god still moves son god still moves so from the time i was little they were they were drilling this in me um i got into the whole rap life all that style uh you know stuff that i was doing that lifestyle and got away from what my mother and father had planted in me but it was still on the inside of me. Like they had planted the right seeds and ready to bloom when it was time to bloom. And when my father um, passed away, that brought me back to God and really pushed me back in that direction and reconnect with my maker. And my mother, um, every time I would go out and speak, uh, I usually call her and she, she always says, make sure you tell them God still moves. Uh -huh. Make sure you tell them. Because a lot of people think, you know, that you read these stories and, and they're in ancient times and you think, okay, well, that was good in ancient times, but it's modern times. And, you know, is God still here? And I'm like, yes, God is still here and God is moving now more than ever. So I, it, it's part of my calling um, and mission to let people know that God still moves. God still loves them. He'll never leave them nor forsake them. And um, he's just as powerful today as he's always been. So, you know, that's, that's where that uh, originated from. Got it. Okay, so you've got quite an audience now, right? And I know that, that we started, we started what? It's only been about four or five years? Mm -hmm. yeah, I started, I, I wrote my book in um, 2016 um, and actually started doing YouTube in early 2017. Wow. Um, I had been teaching the men's group at church um, 2015 and 16. I started in 15. So um, yeah, I guess we're going on four to five years almost. Like Okay, so... It's almost like the bamboo seed, right? Did we build mm -hmm. the audience in four or five years? Or did we build the audience in the 17 in the music and then the four or five right. for a total of 23 years, right? I mean, right. I'll let, I'll let you answer that. Well, I wouldn't have been ready for the people, you know, in, in four to five years. It needed, I needed that long um, preparation process. I'm probably a little stubborn and a little, um, you know, Close-minded sometimes that God has to work on me. So it took me a little longer, maybe than it would took somebody else for Him to work on me and develop me and and um, prepare me for what I'm doing now, man. And at the time when I was going through the panic attacks for that, what I call the seven year struggle or whatever, um, man, I would never want anyone ever to go through what I went through. But I would never been here today had I not been through that struggle. It made no sense whatsoever to have everything ripped away from me the way it was ripped away from me. It made no sense at the time. Um, I had to really, really find my faith in that time because up until this point, I'd always been looking at life in short intervals. Like we'd put a song out. We had a three, five months, six months um, type of lifespan on a song. Then you did another song and you went to the radio again. So like I was set up mentally that you had to get something within this three to five months or you just didn't get it. You know, when I started getting sick and this PTSD came on me and all this. Three months went by, five months went by, six months went by, a year went by, two years went by, three years went by. So it just seemed like this was going to be the rest of my life. I was like, you know, I didn't see any light. I didn't see any change. I didn't see any um, healing going on. I'm sitting there praying every single day. I'm struggling every single day, feeling the worst I've ever felt 
in a dark spot and nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. No matter what I'm doing, nothing is changing. And the enemy was telling me, this is the rest of your life. All the good days, all that fame, all, the, all that stuff is over. This is your new life, you know? And I really had to see God in this moment. And um, that's what molded and shaped my faith and prepared me for what I'm doing now. So when we talk about five years now, it took five years. Well, that seems easy to me now after going through that seven year struggle. So I, I look in bigger time frames now, longer time frames, and not threatened or intimidated by having to go out and build something. And, I, and that was a total change from the way I was in the music business. So um, like, like I said before, I would never want somebody to go through what I went through in those, those seven years. But sometimes the struggle, it's the struggle that makes us, man. We are a product. You hear some of my messages. I talk about the product of the struggle. We are, that's what we are. It's not the struggle that defines us. It's how we uh, respond to the struggle. Right. So my thing was get up and, and show other people how to get out of the struggle just like God um, let me out. So you said something in an interview about, about the book and how mm -hmm. you wrote it in one summer, right? Right. And then... And then you started making the messages and then you started sharing mm -hmm. those messages. Right. And, and, you know, I know what it's like to create a message and to share it. And like the only one clicking on it was me. <laughs> right, 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 right. I know what that feels like or my friends and family. In an interview, you talked about one moment where you and your wife had a spat. And as mm -hmm. a married man and, you know, we all know right. what that's like. And right. you, you went down, I don't know where you, you had a studio in your house. Is that what you yes. did? Mm -hmm. You went down to the studio and you started venting and just recording affirmations. And that, right, and right. I heard those affirmations. Right. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. And what did that turn into? Well, when I got out of the PTSD and started coming back online, what I call it, coming back into life, um, I still hadn't found myself. I was really in the same spot I was when I, you know, was getting out of the music business. I, I was like, okay, Lord, you took me away from this that I knew for 17 years. I was so sure about my identity and now it's gone. Who am I? So I was coming out of this um, days and beginning to find myself. God was giving me pieces. Like he put me, like I said, the men's group, I started speaking there, um, wrote the book. <clears throat> in the very beginning of me doing uh, YouTube messages. I, I didn't understand the gravity of what I was doing. I didn't understand how the big plan God had coming. I was just doing it. Like you said, I was doing a few videos and a few people were clicking on them. Most of my family, you know, it wasn't like there was any big following, nothing like that. So I'm really just walking in blind faith, but I'm, I'm aggressively pursuing it, but I don't see, there's no evidence. There's no like, oh, you're going to be this world speaker. You're going to sell books all over. There was none of that. I had the book back in my hand, maybe two months you know, and it just fell into, you know, people I knew it wasn't, you know, outside of, of this. Um, so financially, I began to feel the pressure. You know, I had all this money put up from the music business and it had all been um, ripped away over time. And now I'm getting time to that desperation point. Now the money's running out, right? And I still got these big dreams and ambitions and all this and I'm talking right, but the money's running out and there's no physical evidence of what I'm saying that's going to manifest. So my wife and I... Um, you know, began to have, like, like you said, you know, disagreements about money, stress coming in. You know, um, the enemy would, would get a hold of her mouth sometime without her knowing and trying to kill what I'm doing today. Because the enemy will do that. If he, if he can't get you to sow destruction over your life, he'll get somebody around you and get in their mouth to do it, to sow it back on you. Yeah. So it, without her knowing, this was what was going on. Because he, he knew what was coming. The enemy knew what was coming. And he was trying to destroy it before it got started. And we would have these disagreements over um, money and, and, and sometimes the enemy would get in there and say like, why won't you be realistic? Why don't you go get a nine to five? And why don't you do this? And why don't you be like everybody else? And, you know, and I'm like, no, God put something else in me. I feel it. I don't know what it is, but I know this is something. I don't know what I got to do, but I just know I got to trust him with this. You know, and this was the battle back and forth, back and forth. You know, I, and that day that you're mentioning about when I went down to the studio, I got to the crossroads there's no evidence showing that I'm going to do anything that I'm doing now. It was just like a dream, a pipe dream. And I got to that fork in the road and it was like on the left reality, nine to five, the, 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 what I call spiritual amnesia, doing the, the, the just above broke, all that stuff there. Right. Doing things that you're not passionate about just to pay the bills, trading in your call and your love, your fire for the world. Right. And on the right was unlimited. All things are possible. Freedom, liberation, fire, love, truth, all of this over here. Right. So I got to this crossroad. Now, to, to make that right turn, man, it was going to take absolute, you're going to have to buy in absolute all 120% faith. So I got down to that mic and I was so angry. Um, not at her. I was angry at life that life was not 
um, reflecting back what was on the inside of me. Like I knew on the inside, I was much greater than the world was shown, like on the outside, right? right? So I get in front of this mic and I'm about at that breaking point. Like, am I just gonna go back and think this is a dream or am I gonna continue pursuing it? And I had to remind myself in that moment, hold on. You know, your mother, your father, you, they didn't raise you like this. They, they raised me in faith. They raised me to believe, to do big things and, and set your mind on global things. And I got in front of that mic and I said, I was born a champion raised a champion i got champion in my bloodline all i ever be is a champion and i and i did this just over and over and over and, and i'm trying to convince myself when you hear this message it's not really for anybody else i didn't intend for this thing to go global it was just me saying look don't forget who you are and and i get on that mic aggressively and just say my truth out loud you know they in you know, the word says death and life and the power of the tongue those that love it shall eat the fruits thereof. So I started speaking that. I was like, I've got to get myself right now. I've got to get a hold of myself and not let this doubt creep in. So I, I just did this um, message for me. And I ended up releasing it that weekend. Uh, a couple big motivational channels grabbed the, the message, put it out on their channel. Man, it went global. Millions, viral, all of that. And then the book started selling. I mean, like almost like within a month later, the book was selling. I was sending it all over the world. Man, 27 countries now. Um, the book is everywhere, but it all started with faith because like I said, there was no evidence of what I was doing. It all started with me speaking that which I wanted and declaring my true identity, what God had designed me to do and just, just walking it out, man. So that was a pivotal point in my life going down there and that, and get in front of that mic. That was, that was the difference maker. That's where everything you still changed. listen to that, to, to those affirmations. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it, it reminds me, like, like I say, the times that, you know, you get down, you, you think something's not happening fast enough, I put that back on. Like, you got to remember who you are. Because I feel like most people today um, are walking around in spiritual amnesia. And, and what I mean by that is when we come out the womb, we've been in the presence with God, and then we come into this physical world. Okay, when we first come out, we know exactly who we are. We know exactly what our talents are, our gifts are, our mission, our, our purpose, all of this. OK, and then when the, the doctor hits us on the back from that moment forward, the world starts bombarding us with lies, saying you're not good enough. You know, not, you're not the right color. You don't come from the right background. You don't have the education. You know, you're not tall enough, short enough, fat enough, skinny enough, whatever it is. And, it, and the world just keeps bombarding us with these lies, trying to shape our identity and to get us to buy into the world's identity instead of the one that God gave us. And after years and years and years of hearing this, we do, we buy into this, just we, we succumb to that, right? And we forget that we're strong and we're powerful. We have a reason to be here. We're a purpose. We're not a mistake that God loves us. All these things, we forget all of that. So yeah. we're walking around the spiritual amnesia, accepting what the world is projecting on us instead of us projecting onto the world. So once you wake up to your own identity is when things start to change. And in front of that mic, I reaffirm my identity because I had been gone for seven years and not, you know, the, the enemy had been beating on me. And finally I had got that mic back and I'm like, I'm taking back control of my life. So sometimes we have to speak to the enemy. Like some of you out there that are listening right now, you might be in that same predicament. You might be on that, that, that crossroad. You need to speak your true identity and speak it to the world, you know? And yeah, I always I'm, say this, are we living life or is life living us? You know what I mean? That's that, true. that, 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 and the thing is, we want to get behind the wheel and start living and start projecting. We were never meant to be the, the movie screen. What I say about that is the canvas. You know, you have a projector and a canvas. We were never meant to be the movie screen with the world projecting its identity onto us. We were meant to be the projector. God told us who we are. That's the source. It runs through the projector, and we're supposed to project it onto the world. But the world has got us flipped. It's become the projector, and we are the screen, and it's telling us everything we can't do, everything we don't have the money to do. Oh, you can't do that dream. You're going to fail. What about if you go bankrupt? What if you don't sell real estate? What if you don't do all this? Don't take the real estate. What if you fail? Like, all of this stuff, right? We have to get behind the wheel and say, so what? Man, God made me. I'm, I'm going to step out in this thing, and I'm going to go 120 with this life that I have, and I'm not going to live with regret, you know? I, th over this um, Christmas holiday, I went back to Alabama when my father's buried and I went to the grave site and I saw his and I began to walk through the, the cemetery there and I saw all these headstones. You know, some people died at eight years old, some died at 98 years old, some died at 30 years old. And I'd read what was on these headstones, man. And so many stories, so many lives. And I said, the last, you know, the worst thing we can do is end up in this ground knowing we didn't give it all right here. You know, my, my wife said to me, you know, this, you know, this is a tragedy, all these people in, in the cemetery. I said, no, the real tragedy is probably none of them lived. 
That's the real tragedy. So when we, when we came back here to Orlando, I said, well, this year we're going to make sure we live. We're going to make sure that we do every single thing that we are capable of doing and we're going to trust God with everything else. I'm not going to go down saying I didn't live. I don't want to go, you know, to my deathbed thinking, oh, I wish I would have took a shot. I wish I'd have took a chance at what I had on the inside. I wish I would have listened to the music that was playing on the inside of me and sung it to the world. You know what I mean? So yeah, like, yeah. there's a bunch of you out there right now and, and I feel like God is moving um, on me to say this. There's many of you in the same position. Don't live your life with regret. Give it all. Give it all. The worst thing we could do is go to, to the grave with all this in us that we didn't leave the world. Yeah, 100%. I agree That's right. 100%. So there's, there's power in those affirmations, man. And you can hear it in your voice. I'm going to share a link on our Facebook group so that they can, they can listen to those affirmations. And I firmly believe that it does something to you when you record yourself saying these affirmations yourself right, right. and you say it with that conviction and that confidence. Mm -hmm. Because, right. you know, you, you just reading words, monotone doesn't do anything. But when you right, really right. feel it, it right, does right. happen to you, and I, and I can hear it in, in your affirmations, and I, I tell everybody that I recently, just recently, recorded my own affirmations, and I play it to myself. The minute I wake up, I got the AirPods in, and I'm listening to it like, you know, my wife didn't like it at first, because, you know, I, I wake up, get out of bed, put them on, but that's the first thing mm -hmm. I listen to before I start my day, so right. I get it, man. I get it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, okay. What is the best way to maximize the book and to take advantage of it so that the people that do get copies or the people that order copies, and I'm going to put the link there so that people can order copies. I know that it's a little bit like a journal. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like an action plan. Uh, you call it a blueprint. So what's the best way to do this? Uh, you know, cause there's going to be some that are going to be aggressive and they're going to be like, I'm going to try to read the whole thing in the whole day, like in one day. No, like, no. How do you, how no. do you tackle it? And what's the best way to use it? The best way is, is, is set up for 31 days, a daily program. And, and there's a reason for that because there's so much um, that you need to grasp, you know, really one day is not enough to even grasp it, but I broke it down in 31 days so people can process it that way. This should be something that you go back every 31 days and start the program back over again until you absorb it. And the power in that book to transform um, is in the self-assessment question. See, questions will take you wherever you want to go in life. You just got to ask the right question. And what I've done is lay out questions right there that will initiate momentum will initiate discovery and awareness of oneself. So I've laid the, all those questions out. There's about 12 to 13 questions in every um, daily plan there. And what a person needs to do that wants massive change in their life is sit down, take the time, cut everything out uh, on the outside and just get alone and work the self-assessment questions. You know, once, how can we know the world if we don't know ourselves how can we right. just you know um bring much to the table if we ourselves are, are still unaware of the gifts and the talents that we have on the inside so i believe another reason that things began to take off in 17 was in 16 i wrote that book and i answered all those questions myself there's over 300 something questions in that book self-assessment questions so i had to answer those myself and those things began to set um momentum you know, they began to create an inertia of its own. And by the 17, I had discovered myself. And I think it started way back when, when I was, you know, developing these questions for others that it actually was helping me do it at the same time. So yeah. I would say that was the key to me um, discovering my own identity, my own calling was working through those, those steps in that book. I've laid out some really simple um, and easy to apply daily action steps in that book. So a lot of people say, well, I don't know how to get started. Okay, you got day one. Um, there's some wisdom in there. It's all rooted in the word of God. Like you'll, you'll see um, day one, it, it talks about detoxing emotionally, getting, getting right on the inside. I lay a Bible verse out there that, that shows the, the wisdom of it. Um, then I come to the self-assessment questions and, and get you to really examine your insides. Like, you know, who do you need to forgive? What do you need to let go of? Things like this and just um, search on the inside and get the inside right. And every single day I, I, I lay these questions out and I give an uh, action step to take. And if you take the action steps and you do this day in and day out, it will begin to create momentum in your life and you'll begin to see change. See, most people read books but never apply this stuff. They'll just skim through the questions. And I'm telling you, if you want to want the massive change, if you want the, the success, that next level, you got to do the homework. What separates the ones on top from the ones on bottom is just they did more homework. 
You know, we got to do the homework. <laughs> a lot of people come in and say, well, can I get the audio book? No, this is, I did it in a physical copy for a reason. <laughs> because I, don't want you... I went to Audible and I was looking right, for it. <laughs> right, right. But, but, but this is different. Like if you want to be entertained and you want to, to be calm, you do the audio thing. But if you want actual change, you got to take action. And that's why I only put that in, in the physical hard copy. Got I've got stuff for audio when people want to do that. I have that. But if you want change, you've got to do the homework. So I, I've laid it out this way, Um, you know, I'm not going to lie to people and say, oh, I, it, it's very easy. It's not. You're going to have to put some work in. Yeah, for sure. But, but it's so worth it when you find yourself and you step into the fullness of what God has called you. Man, there's nothing else like it, nothing comparative to it. So anybody out there listening, you are worth it. So do the homework for you. It's not for me or anyone else. It's for you. Do the homework. Got it. So what do you say to the person, the guy or gal, that's putting in the work? They're grinding, they're working, mm -hmm. they're trying, they're waking up early, they're coming in early, they're staying late, right. and, and, they're, and they're not seeing the results. What do you, what do you say to that person uh, to keep them going? Okay, there's, there's two parts here. First of all, um, what I did in the music business when I kept hitting that ceiling, I went to God first and said, okay, hold on, let me make sure I'm in the right place to begin with. Because sometimes we're out of position, we're trying to make something happen that we weren't designed to make happen. Right. So I come back to God and I say, OK, if you're in this, um, let me know. If not, move me to what it is that you call me to do. Now, once you realize, OK, this is what God has assigned me to do. It's taking a little while and things aren't popping. What I tell people at this point in time is we have to buy into the process. We have to get our eyes off the scoreboard and onto the process, the things that put points on the scoreboard. So like in, in, in real estate, we don't look at the sales and say, well, I made, you know, 10 million sales, whatever. We don't look at that. We look at what causes sales to begin with marketing uh, customer service grind knowing your market knowing how to connect with people solving problems we get to the basics to the process and if we do those things every single day at a high level you know the first page in that book is says success is a marathon of consistency walked out one day at a time so if we get up every single day and do the right things eventually the points are going to show up on that score but they have to it, it, it's the law of, of return so if we sow into this, it will eventually harvest. Our thing is usually the time. Like you said before, we want, we want something to happen today that requires six months to happen. Yeah. You know, and we get discouraged by that. And when we don't see it, it affects how we get up today and what we do today. And then it becomes a problem. So, but if you take your eyes off the scoreboard and say, okay, this is where I want to go. Let's say I want to do 20 million in real estate, whatever it is. You say, okay, this is where I want to go. This is what I'm going to keep out there. But my nose and my focus is going to be on today. And I'm going to do every single thing from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. I'm going to do the things that are, that are required to produce that. And that's where I'm going to put all my focus. And that's how I'm going to judge my day. I'm not going to judge it, well, did I make a sale today? No. I'm going to judge it by did I do the things that are required at a high level that will produce sales. And if I do that every single day, then those sales will eventually show up. And, you know, is it okay if I share with everybody that, that, that your, your wife is an agent? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. a broker associate, yeah. She just won, uh, <laughs> no. she just won Realtor of the Year in, in this whole area, in this whole county. And uh, last year, she, she got nominated to be um, president of the Women's Council of Realtors. And she's on the board here, man. So, and she, and she did it at a fast time. Like, I think the, the quickest time ever. She did it in three and a half years, man. So wow. it was amazing to go from, she won rookie of the year and then two years later won realtor of the year, man. So it's is she, pretty is she, awesome. Is she applying the same principles? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she, uh, <laughs> me and her, it's hard to be her, a, a prophet in your own town, man. <laughs> God is good, man. See, these things are not me. These are just principles and laws that have always been in place. And anybody can tap into them. I always say this, truth doesn't discriminate. Anybody can tap into it and produce and bear the fruit from it. So you find out in your business, your field, whatever it is you're doing, what is the truth in your business? Like what produces your results, right? And you align with that truth. And if as long, like I said, as long as you consistently align with that truth, the results will begin to show. So, and we, my wife and I started back in the music business. She's been with me since 1998. So she saw the grind, saw the hustle and the things we did in that. And when she got into her calling, she started out in title. She did a title um, for 15 years, you know, oh, just wow. doing the nine to five. She liked real estate, but wanted more. So when she found her true calling, which was um, being a realtor, she had all these principles in place already that had been embedded. So it was just really like, I just need to find me. And once I find me, I've got the blueprint. And she did. She found herself and boom, it was off to the races, man. Great. Okay, so you guys heard it first. Now, we'll end with this. 
Uh, last year you had your world tour, or you had your nationwide tour. What do we? What can we expect in twenty? Yeah, we still we still and we're doing the right now. We're doing first first United States. We're doing the top forty cities in the United States. Okay. Is the there biggest a population site that we can reference. So we yes, can yes. If you go to if you go to blessed and unstoppable dot com and then just click on the tour on the tab, it has all the, the dates right there. But we coming to a, a major city near you, anywhere you're at in the United States, we coming. If it's a, a big major city, we coming. And uh, right. the first phase is the United States, and then second phase is the globe. So That's we uh, we letting God do His thing, man. Well, you got a bunch of fans here. You got a bunch of fans here. So we appreciate you doing this for us. We appreciate you sending this to me uh, and, and, and taking the time, man. There's some, there's some great information. Um, uh, real quick before I end, I'm going to let, I'm going to open it up for any questions on the Facebook group. And then, um, and then I'll let you go in about four minutes. Is that good? That's good, man. Let's rock and roll. And let's see. Man, I love Cali. I'm actually coming there uh, in April to San Fran. We'll have to maybe catch oh, really? up when, when I come okay. to San Fran. I'll come down to, to LA when I come out there or something like that. See if we can catch up. You're doing this for me. Absolutely. I'll introduce you to my, my five kids. How many? Do you have children? No, no. We don't have children yet. We, just we a little five. dog. That's our child. We, uh, we, treat, we treat it just like a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a, a toy poodle and five kids, so I know what that's like. Yeah, man. Okay. So one of the questions that's slowly starting to come up is what was the process like to actually write the book? Um, how did you, how did you finish it? You did it in one summer? Yeah, the, it, it was done it several times, to be honest. Um, I had this book idea put in me around 2009, but I was still in the panic attacks and, and, yeah, and PTSD. Um, I started reading more and more on the mind at this time because I'm trying to heal myself, right? I'm trying to, nothing is working. So I'm, I'm diving into these books, trying to find my own uh, way out of my mind. So I started doing the, the, the personal development and, and psychology, just really focusing on that and trying to find my way out. And I kept feeling like, oh, I'd love to write about this. I love this stuff. I'd love to write about this. But I didn't think I was qualified at that time to write. I was like, well, you know, who's going to listen to me? And, without, you know, all the negativity, the enemy projecting onto me yeah. saying that I wasn't qualified. Um, around 2012, I, I mapped out a vision for my company, Positive Worldwide, and I had put on there. Um, one of the things we we're going to do with the company was write self-help books. But here again, I still didn't think like, I'm, you know, who am I? What am I qualified? All this. Um, but around 15, when I started teaching that, that men's group, I began to discover myself a little bit more and understood um, the things that God was gifting me with. And it, I just started getting that itch again because I'd been out of music for so long. I'd been writing songs for years and now I had no way to express. When I got out of music business, the one thing I missed was a way to express myself in some kind of creative form. So um, I was like, man, I, I want to write. I want to write. I want to write. But I couldn't get past that. You know, how am I going to write a book? How am I going to write a book? I could write maybe one page, but how do you write a full book? Um, you already have the PhD then? No, no, no. I got this awarded later. The PhD, I got awarded for making impact. It was okay. last year when I got awarded the PhD. Okay. Um, but this time I'm, I'm, I'm just teaching the group and I'm writing these lessons that I'm doing every Monday. I'm teaching like an hour and a half, two hours on a Monday night. So I'm having to put like 10 hours of prep in to do these hour and a half, two, and a, um, two hour sessions. So I was like, over the summer, they asked me to teach the whole summer. It was going to be like 13 weeks. Um, and, I, and I'm doing the math. I'm like 10 hours of study for each week, for 13 weeks. That's 130 hours. I'm like, man, that's an education. So I was like, why don't I take all this research that I'm doing and all this stuff that I'm teaching at the men's group, which is going over crazy um, good, and people are really getting um, healed and changing and things like that from it. I was like, why don't I assemble all that while I'm preparing it and just assemble it into the book? So I started writing the book. I got real passionate about it. I wrote maybe 100 pages. Um, 120 pages or whatever. I was like, wow, this is really good. But the book was going to be 300 something pages. And when I got to about 100, I'm like, I started looking at the scoreboard, like we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, and not the process. And I was like, how am I going to get way over there? How am I going to do another 200 pages? I wrote all day, every single day, everything I know how to do, and I'm only at 100. And I still got um, two times that to write. So I began, began um, to get discouraged and take my eye off the prize and started looking at you know, things instead of the process. So I got so discouraged by it, I quit. I stopped writing the book, period. I was like, there's no way I'm going to write that. There's no way I'm going to finish that. So two months went by, three months went by, and I had quit. I completely got out of it. 
And a guy had sent me this email about, and it had an article in it about Stephen King and the guy who wrote Game of Thrones. And they were out on a, on a book tour. And my friend that sent me the article wasn't sending it to me about writing, but the message was in there that God needed me to get. That's how God works. Sometimes we don't know why it's coming, but the message is in there. Well, he sent this article and um, the guy from Game of Thrones asked Stephen King in the book tour, he's like, how do you come out with so many books? Like you write a book every three to four months. How do you do this? He's like, it takes me nine months to write a chapter and you've got three books out by the time I do a chapter. And uh, Stephen King said something profound in there. He said, you know, I sit down every single day and strive to write three to five pages every single day. He's like, I don't critique it. I don't judge it. I don't edit it. I don't do any of that stuff. I just sit down and write three to five pages a day. And he said, in 30 days, I've got 90 to 150 pages. And in three months, I've got a full book. And then we go back and edit and figure out what's good and what's not. So it was the daily process, right? Like I was saying before, like if you focus on the process and not on the scoreboard, if you do the things day in and day out, eventually they'll show up on the scoreboard. I got that principle right there out of that article. And that's why I put it in the first page in that book. Success is a marathon of consistency walked out one day at a time. I learned that myself. I was like, okay, that's the principle right there. Sometimes we, you know, we can't build the big thing overnight, but we can do it day by day. The bigger the dream, the more it must be spoken down into small manageable pieces. And that's what I did. I started writing again. And I was like, okay, if I write every day and do this and this, this, I said, okay, I'll have it by my birthday. And that's exactly what I did. I just uh, picked up where I had let off and um, finished the book, man. So I was like, this, this was a profound now, lesson. Now we benefit from it. So this is going to be our required reading for this month. Thank you for taking the time. When you get out to San Francisco, so you guys go to his website, blessedandunstoppable.com. Take a look at the tour. For those of you that don't have, um, for those of you that don't have uh, the books, make sure you order the book. Uh, and then when you get to San Francisco, let me know so we can we can get together. Definitely, man. Tell them to also check out check me out on YouTube. I got the, the motivational videos on it. If you just type in my name, Billy, B-I-L-Y, Allsbrooks, A-L-S-B-R-O-O-K-S. Man, I got 170-something videos on there. They're all free. So you need to get up and get rocking, get on your sales, whatever. They'll help you out. I watch them. My kids watch them. They're great videos. It's good stuff, man. It's really, really, it inspires the hell out of me. Man, I appreciate it, man. I thank okay. you for having me on, man. It's been an honor to, to be able to speak to your people today, man. All right, buddy. Take care. You too, man. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Bye-bye.